Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of NYC Crime Spot. Today, we will be discussing Manya Elson, the Soviet Jewish emigre who made his way to the United States in the 1970s. He's a man who made a name for himself through extortion, drug dealing, theft, and murder. In his life, he would claim to have taken part in over a hundred murders. And even more bizarrely, it's suspected that some of these murders he committed alongside his wife, Marina Elson. In the 2009 Robert Friedman book, Red Mafia, an unnamed Genovese family gangster would claim, quote, it was a sex thing. They got off on the withering bodies, unquote. During his criminal career, Elson's tentacles stretched out across the globe, and he became a notorious death cheater. After fleeing the United States for Italy in 1993, Manya Elson would be arrested in March of 1995 and be extradited from Italy to the United States in August of 1996. He would be sent back to the U.S. to face numerous federal charges. On May 15, 1996, a hearing before the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Committee on Governmental Affairs, United States Senate, 104th Congress, would meet in Washington, D.C. in order to discuss Russian organized crime in the United States. This hearing would include testimony from law enforcement, former Russian organized crime members, as well as former Italian organized crime members like Anthony Gaspipe Casso and Michael Francis. In that same year of 1996, a report on Russian emigre crime in the tri-state region would also come out. This report was compiled by a commission which included agencies representing New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Furthermore, in November of 1994, a multinational working group on Eurasian organized crime met in Moscow, Russia to discuss the threat posed by Eurasian criminal organizations. The working group consisted of Russian, German, Italian, and U.S. law enforcement representatives. They identified five Eurasian criminal groups with multinational operations that are of mutual investigative interest. This report would also come out in 1996. Across these meetings... Manya Elson would be mentioned as a prominent world figure in Russian organized crime. The Washington, D.C. committee would list Elson as the head of an organization who trafficked in heroin in the New York area. The tri-state region meeting on Russian organized crime, which consisted of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, would also identify Manya as a known criminal and would list 65 incidents of Russian organized crime murder and attempted murder occurring in the tri-state area between the years of 1981 and 1995. Manya Elson's name would be featured prominently across this list. It would be the report from the multinational meeting in Moscow that would end up giving us at that time the clearest picture of Manya Elson's criminal activity, stating, quote, Elson is a principal player in the control of diamonds, gold, and other jewelry exports from the United States and other countries to Russia. Elson receives a kickback on every diamond and jewelry deal he brokers in Moscow, unquote. The Moscow report would state that Manya Elson was not only a prolific criminal in his own right, heading his own crew, but was connected to perhaps the most powerful mobster in all the world, Semyon Mogilevich, a man at that time who reportedly had 250 men under him. His organization was said to be involved in weapons trafficking, nuclear materials trafficking, prostitution, drug trafficking, dealing in precious gems, and money laundering. According to the report, the Mogilevich organization operated across Central Europe, including Prague, Czech Republic, Vienna, Austria, and Moscow, Russia. Its activities also extended to the United States, Ukraine, United Kingdom, France, Slovakia, and Israel. Till today, Semyon Mogilevich is a wanted fugitive. In the United States, in April of 2022, the FBI put out a bulletin offering a $5 million reward for his capture. In regard to Manya Elson's relationship to Mogilevich, the report would state that Elson was connected to Mogilevich through his relationships with a man named Segan, a.k.a. Gypsy. Segan operated in Los Angeles and was reportedly a right-hand man of Manya Elson. Segan assisted Elson, Mogilevich, and other Russian criminals like Vyacheslav Ivankov in the laundering of millions of dollars through South America, Luxembourg, and Budapest. Semyon Mogilevich would also fly into the United States from Budapest in order to have personal meetings with Segan. Manya Elson was also said to be invested in what was known as Semyon Mogilevich's black and white nightclubs, which operated in Budapest and Prague. 
These clubs were used for lucrative prostitution and money laundering operations. Most importantly, the report would claim that Semyon Mogilevich was the main man responsible for Manya Elson's relocation out of the United States and into Italy in 1993. But why did Elson flee America? And what was he doing in the United States? And how did this man get into a life of crime? This is Hard to Kill, the story of Manya Elson, Brighton Beach, Brooklyn gangster, an international criminal. Manya Elson was born on May 23, 1951, in Kishinev, Moldova. At that time, Moldova was one of 15 Soviet Union republics. He would describe the area he grew up in as a Jewish ghetto. Elson would say that a year after his birth, Joseph Stalin would release thousands of gulag inmates into the area of Kishinev, who Elson grew up around and became inspired by. In regard to Elson's criminal beginnings, we would be given two narratives on the matter. Manya Elson would tell Red Mafia author Robert Friedman that he was a criminal from a young age, being schooled in the art of theft, extortion, and the highly prized skill of pickpocketing. He would ultimately leave Moldova and make his way to Moscow, where he started a family and joined a gang of fierce extortionists. He would claim that extortion was his specialty and that he was very good at it, doing it thousands of times. Boris Neifeld, a Soviet emigre and Brighton Beach gangster friend turned foe of Elson's, would later state that Elson was a schwitz, or someone who liked to brag. He would explain in the Douglas Century book, The Last Dawn of Brighton Beach, that Elson was a Soviet army tank man, and then a bus driver. He would make it clear that Elson wasn't a product of the prison system, like so many Soviet criminals, but only picked up their slang and mannerisms by being around a few real criminals. Whatever the case may be, Elson would certainly make a criminal name for himself when he would arrive to the United States in 1978. One of thousands of Soviet Jewish emigre who were allowed to leave the USSR in the 1970s, many settling in Israel and the United States. Unfortunately, a portion of those coming over were hardened criminals in the old country. Upon his entry into the United States, he would settle in Brighton Beach, often referred to as Little Odessa. It's a Brooklyn neighborhood where thousands of Soviet emigrants settled and still remains today as a stronghold for many Russian-speaking immigrants. Elson would get involved in the trafficking of Turkish heroin, robbery, burglary, and a bevy of other rackets. He would make many criminal friendships with those who shared his upbringing in the USSR. These friendships included Boris Neifeld, a Brighton Beach mobster who already established himself in the United States, and Boris Neifeld's boss, the first Russian Don of Brighton Beach, Yevsia Grown. However, his first criminal associate that he would make real money with was a man by the name of Yuri Brokin, a man I spoke about previously in my upload about Vladimir Reznikov. Yuri Brokin was a screenwriter, director, author, and journalist who came to the United States in 1972. He's often described as a Russian dissident and a man who critiqued the USSR. His books include Big Red Machine, the Rise and Fall of Soviet Olympic Champions, and Hustling on Gorky Street, Sex and Crime in Russia Today. Broken's writings were also featured in various news editorials throughout the United States. He would even appear on an episode of To Tell the Truth in 1975. Will the real Yuri Brokin please stand up? Yeah. <laughs> I always get the writers. In Russia, we have a lot of part-time hookers because their uh, full-time salary not enough to be uh, uh, to be just uh, yes. respectable, respectful member of the society. Later on in 1978, Broken would also appear on Good Morning America, discussing the ways Russia trains its athletes. According to Elson, Yuri Broken would serve as his cohort on numerous jewelry heists. One of their scams involved dressing up as Hasidic Jews in order to rob Jewish merchants in Manhattan's Diamond District. Yuri would distract the shop owners with a conversation in Yiddish, while Elson would switch the shop's diamonds with zirconia. In September of 1980, Broken and Elson would be arrested at 5 North Wabash Avenue in Chicago's Diamond District. They were accused of trying to swindle a jeweler out of $52,000 in gold chains. Once again, they were dressed as Hasidic Jews, trying to take advantage of a Jewish dealer. 
Oddly, there would do no time for this offense, nor did Yuri's arrest reverberate throughout the country as one would imagine. I could only find this small blurb from the Chicago Tribune. Yuri was already a nationally recognized figure in regard to Russian politics and culture, so it really makes you wonder how this arrest went under the radar. Yuri Broken would be found shot dead in his Manhattan apartment in 1982, a year after his wife died a suspicious drowning death. For more on that, once again, please check out my upload on Vladimir Reznikov. Alson would continue to make connections in organized crime circles in Brighton Beach, working for boss F.C. Agron and forming a relationship with Agron's right-hand man, Boris Nafeld. However, Nafeld would say that F.C. always kept Manya Elson at a distance. He didn't want to get too close to him or have him in the inner circle. In 1984, Manya Elson would be arrested for cocaine trafficking. Elson would state that he made cocaine connections in South America and was funneling keys into Europe and Israel. It would be in Israel that he would finally be caught and given a six-year sentence, which he served at a prison in Israel's Negev desert. In 1990, Manya Elson would be released and make his way back to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. He was entering a neighborhood with a much different power structure than the one he left. The extortion, the gas schemes, the violence, all continued on. However, the year Elson went to prison in 1984, Brighton Beach's first godfather, Yevsi Sia Grown, would be executed inside his Kensington, Brooklyn apartment building. The next boss, Murad Balagula, who had been making a name for himself for over a decade in Brighton Beach, would be sentenced to federal prison in 1989. Elson would soon go back to his violent ways. He formed a group that would become known as Manya's Brigada. They would engage in extortion, jewelry heists, drug trafficking, and it is said that Manya's Brigada would also engage in contract murder. He would be listed as employed by the Rasputin restaurant and nightclub, at 2670 Coney Island Avenue. However, the establishment would serve more as a headquarters for Manya and his criminal associates. Manya Elson would soon find that an old acquaintance of his, Boris Nafeld, had become a new boss in Brighton Beach. At that time, Nafeld was making big money in the smuggling of heroin from Southeast Asia, through Poland, and into the United States. But according to Elson, Nafeld was a quote, fucking nobody. He would also go on to bash Nafeld's pedigree, and say that he was not leadership quality. In time, an all-out war would break out on the streets of Brighton Beach. January 14, 1991. Police would discover a bomb under Boris Nafeld's Lincoln. The Lincoln, which was parked by an elementary school near Brighton 6th Street, was spotted by a school security guard who noticed something suspicious hanging from under the car. The NYPD bomb squad would make the way to the scene to defuse the situation. Not exactly the kind of attention Boris Nafel was looking for. Ultimately, Nafel would get word that it would be Manya Elson who attempted to launch him into oblivion. At this time, Manya Elson was also warring with another Brighton Beach criminal, a man by the name of Vacheslav Leubarsky. Vacheslav would be mentioned in a 1989 New York Times article profiling Soviet emigre mob activity in Brooklyn. They would say this. In another convoluted case, a grocer named Vacheslav Leubarsky was strung up from a ceiling light in his store when he failed to repay 40000 he lost in a card game. He later shot one of his tormentors and with two reputed mafia members went on to stage a fake jewelry robbery in Chicago in an abortive attempt to collect 750000 insurance claim. They even beat up a woman to add credibility, said Detective Peter Grenenko, a Russian-speaking investigator assigned to Brooklyn District Attorney Squad. Vacheslav Leobarsky was also suspected of being involved in drug trafficking and jewel thievery, and a recent deal with Manya Elson went sour. On March 3, 1991, Lyabarsky would be shot inside his apartment building at 125 Brighton 11th Street in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, and plot his revenge. May 14, 1991, Manya Elson is shot multiple times on the streets of Brighton Beach. He would be hit outside the Arbat Cafe on Brighton Beach Avenue. He would describe his attacker as a black man, obviously contracted out by the Russians. He would say this of his injuries. The bullets made two holes in my stomach. My liver was severed. My pancreas was shattered. One bullet lodged in my left kidney and exploded. Doctors removed the kidney along with 20 feet of intestine. If I had gotten there 20 seconds later, I would have been on a slab. They put me on a stretcher and I lost consciousness. January 12, 1992. Vacheslav Lyabarsky and his son Vadim 
a shot dead inside their Brighton 11th Street apartment's fourth floor hallway. Vacheslav's wife would be present for the homicide, watching her husband and son succumb to their injuries. Manya Elson got his revenge. Meanwhile, Boris Nafield was still plotting his own revenge against Elson for the failed bomb plot, but he would pretend to be friendly with Elson. Nafield would even go as far as visiting Elson in the hospital after he was shot and would have meetings with him about doing drug deals. Nafield would leave the United States for business in Antwerp, but not before placing a contract on Elson's head. The man who would receive the contract was 43-year-old Alexander Slepinin, a former Soviet special ops soldier who spent time in Russian prison camps. After finding out the job wasn't finished and already on his way back from Antwerp, Nafield would call off the contract, figuring that he could just do it himself. In turn, Alexander Slepinin would alert Manya Elson of the pending hit and say that he would offer Elson the full details for $50,000. On June 23rd of 1992, Manya Elson would meet Slepinin with his brigada, but he had other plans. <laughs> Manya Elston and his men would blast Slepinin and leave him slumped over in his Cadillac in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Police would say that his bullet-ridden body had crude tattoos, including a dragon, a panther, and an etching on his skin, which signified that he was a Soviet prison camp inmate. In November of 1992, Manya Elson would make his way to Los Angeles to take care of business. And on November 6th, another attempt would be made on his life. Once again, Elson would claim that the deed was done by a black man hired by the Russians. The man would approach him from behind and squeeze the trigger at the base of his skull. However, the trigger would jam. He would wrestle with the man, ultimately being shot in the hand. He would go to the hospital and receive treatment under a fake name, eventually slipping out of the facility unnoticed. Two days later, a man described as Arminian would attempt to plant a bomb under Elson's car. However, the bomb would detonate prematurely. The man would critically injure himself in the explosion. Around that time, Manya Elson would get word that Boris Nafil was traveling to Moscow for business. Elsa would contact a man named Seryoga Baroda, who was the head of a criminal gang operating out of Balashika, Moscow. He would put a $500,000 bounty on Nafil's head. However, the plot would fail when an old friend of Nafil's and close associate of Baroda would tip Nafeld off. According to Nafeld, he narrowly escaped death when he was on the way to one of his shops in Moscow and decided to pull his car around due to traffic. Despite being tipped off, Nafil would later find out that snipers were waiting for him in a construction site across from his shop. Both Manya Elson and Boris Nafil continued to dodge the Grim Reaper, but Dr. Death wasn't done knocking. July 26, 1993. Manya Elson, his wife Marina, and one of his trusted killers and bodyguards Oleg's Zapinikmin would arrive at Elson's home. At that time, Elson was living in a brick townhouse on East 16th Street between Avenue Y and Avenue Z in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Upon exiting their vehicle, an Oldsmobile pulls up quickly upon them. Oleg's Zapinikmin is hit and begins to return fire. Manya Elson is hit in the leg and the back. His wife Marina Elson would get hit with shotgun pellets to the face and chest. Reports would later come out that one of the gunmen was a man named Boris Grigoriev, who was authorized to kill Elton by Igor Grafman and Meyer Itayev. Grafman was a close associate of Boris Neifeld and owned the Metropole restaurant in Brooklyn. Grafman was a drug smuggler and well-known Russian criminal in the area. However, in 1987, a Daily News article would identify Grafman as a former jeweler turned restaurant owner who claimed his establishment was very much a family place. On September 24th of 1993, just a couple of months after the latest shooting incident, Manya's trusted bodyguard, Oleg Zapinikmin, would be shot again. This time he would die on the Brooklyn streets. Manya Elsa spent the last three years in Brooklyn, growing his criminal operation and surviving numerous attempts on his life. It would be in 1993 that Elson seemingly had enough. He would flee out of the United States and take up residence in Fauna, a port city in Italy. An escape from the United States said to be aided by Semyon Mogilevich, a man who Elson claimed to be extremely close with. He would continue to engage in criminal activity while in Italy, running a multi-million dollar money laundering operation for Semyon Mogilevich and trafficking in diamonds and other precious stones and metals. 
1995, it would all end for 44-year-old Manya Elson, when on Wednesday, March 8th, he would be arrested by authorities in Fauna, Italy. He would be held by Italian authorities until August 23, 1996, when he would finally be extradited back to the United States to face federal racketeering and murder charges. Manya Elson would be charged with the June 14, 1991 attempted murder of Boris Neyfeld, the January 12, 1992 murders of Vacheslav Leubarsky and his son Vadim, and the June 23, 1992 murder of Alexander Slepinin. He would also be charged with extortion and conspiring to distribute heroin. By the time Manya Elson was extradited back to the United States, Boris Neyfeld, his longtime nemesis, had already begun cooperating with authorities. Ultimately, Manya Elson would follow suit. He would begin to cooperate with authorities, shedding light on his criminal exploits and the exploits of many criminals operating within the Russian mob, which invaded the United States in the 1970s. Manya Elson would be sent to prison, and by the early 2000s, he would be released due to his cooperation with the government. Here he is in 2003, standing beside crime writer Alexander Grant in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. The murderous Manya Elson received a new lease on life. It would be up to him to stay clean and leave his past behind. The United States Attorney's Office, Eastern District of New York, March 24, 2006. Two Russian organized crime figures, Manya Elson and Leonid Reitman, were arrested this morning for their participation in a plot to murder two Kiev-based businessmen. The arrests are the result of a joint investigation by the United States and Ukrainian law enforcement and were announced today by Rosalind R. Maskov, United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Marche Mershon, Assistant Director in Charge, FBI New York Field Office, and Raymond W. Kelly, Commissioner, NYPD. As alleged in the complaint, Elson is a well-known Russian organized crime figure who was previously convicted of racketeering in federal court in Manhattan. Reutemann is alleged to have ties to the Solnitsevskaya Brigade, one of Russia's most powerful criminal organizations. The complaint charges that beginning in late 2004, Elson and Reutemann sought to hire hitmen in the Ukraine to kill two Kiev-based businessmen, Slava and Alex Konstantinovsky, twin brothers popularly known as the Brothers Karamazov. As part of this plot, in early 2005, Elson dispatched Reutemann to Kiev to meet with the hitmen, one of whom Elson knew because that hitman had previously worked as security guard for Russian businessman and reputed organized crime figure Semyon Mogilevich. Over the course of several meetings in 2005, Reutemann explained that he and Elson wanted the brothers killed so that they could take over the brothers' lucrative business in Ukraine. Reutemann offered the hitman a total of $100,000 to do the job, plus a percentage of the brothers' businesses once the murders had been carried out. Manya Elson fucked up again, and he was heading back to prison. Now, the complaint states that Manya Elson was trying to take over the businesses of Slava and Alex Konstantinovsky, twin brothers properly known as the brothers Karamazov. Now, this is most likely true. However, in the book The Last Boss of Brighton Beach by Douglas Century, it would also state that Manya Elson apparently felt that the brothers Karamazov were a part of a hit on his life dating back to the 1990s when they were living in the United States. Whether that's true or not, I cannot confirm. Manya Elson would be given a seven-year sentence. In 2010, crime reporter Jerry Capisi would put out an article which would add more lore to the legend of Manya Elson. According to Jerry Capisi, new information surfaced which said that in late 1992 or early 1993, Manya Elson had unknowingly escaped death once more. According to the report, Victor Zilber, a Soviet emigre who came to the U.S. in 1979, had arranged for Manya Elson's death with members of the Genovese crime family. Victor Zilber was part owner of Elson's mainstay, the Rasputin Restaurant, and around the time of the murder plot, Zilber had been indicted for his part in a multi-million dollar fuel tax scam. Zilber would arrange for the hit with Genovese soldier and future capo Anthony Palumbo, who would arrange for associate and future government witness John Johnny Bosleto to take care of the job. Manya Elson would be brought to a Bronx social club for a meeting. However, the real point of the meeting was to perform a dry run on the hit. Everything went well. In fact, the article would state that the men involved in the potential hit said that they should have just did it right there. Elson's ticket was up, but when Genovese capo Daniel Pagano found out about the plot, he immediately squashed it. What are you, nuts? No fucking way. We'll have all types of problems with the Russians if you do this. The plan was ended. Manya Elson escaped death 
once more. And with that, another notch in Manya Elson's survival belt. As far as where Manya Elson is today, seems that he's back in the United States, possibly living in his old stomping grounds of Brooklyn. I hope you enjoyed this upload. Please like, subscribe if you have not, and leave a comment and let me know if you enjoyed Hard to Kill, the story of Manya Elson, Brighton Beach, Brooklyn gangster, an international criminal.